Hi, I'm Bern Sargis, president of Oklahoma State University, and we're here for another edition of Inside OSU, and we have a very special guest today, OSU alum Tim Dubois. Tim is one of the big, big names in the music business and uh, has been a tremendous success both as a writer, performer, and, and as a producer. And so we're thrilled to have you back on campus, Tim. I'm glad to be here, Burns. It's a real honor. I should say Dr. Tim. You, well, that's right. You Thank received you uh, an honorary doctorate. Uh, I did. And you're, this is one of the few places that you actually can call me doctor. I, I figured out they don't recognize that outside of Stillwater. <laughs> well, let's drop back, uh, drop back to the beginning. Where were you raised? I was raised in, in Grove, Oklahoma, on Grand Lake. Uh, my mother and father were both teachers there. And I uh, actually uh, grew up on the farm that my mother was born in that my granddad homesteaded when it was still Indian Territory. And one of my nephews still owns the home place, so it's uh, still in the family. Were you, uh, were you involved in music back in those days? Yes. I, I actually always loved music. I started singing like everybody else in church and, and uh, then I, the only instrument that I'm really proficient on is trombone, which it's a little hard to write on trombone. But it, <laughs> but, it's, it, it, <laughs> uh, but I, I picked up guitar in high school. Uh, I play a little bit of piano and have enough music theory I can do that. So how did you uh, make your way to Oklahoma State University? Well, there was really never a question. My older brother had graduated from OSU. My mom and dad both worked there on their master's some. They ended up graduating from Tahlequah, but they worked on their master's there in, during summer school. Uh, and I went there. I was a very uh, big in 4-H club. So I had been going there for 4-H club roundup since I was 10, 11 years old. And you major in accounting. I did. But you continued your music interests. No. Not, well, I didn't play. I didn't play in bands. I always, my whole life, had the affliction of, of wanting to write songs from, from the time I was 15, 16 years old. And I, I figured out somebody had to write these things. Like everybody else, I kind of thought, uh, you know, whoever's singing the song probably wrote it. And then actually I was at a student council camp and and the roommate my roommate brought a guitar in and we were passing the guitar back and forth and and he said let me play you one I wrote and I literally it was like the light bulb went off and I went my goodness you know <laughs> and he played it and I thought well that's not very good I can beat that so <laughs> some people say the songs just come to them yeah. and uh, they just write them down on the paper right. D does it start with the the melody or does it start with the lyrics or when I was uh Working as a professional writer, I was what they call a perspiration writer instead of an inspiration writer, which I, I didn't sit around and wait for God to send me an idea. I, I was in the room almost every day trying to write. Uh, and, and as one of my good friends and heroes, Bob McDill, said in an interview one day, they asked him, well, you can't tell me that you actually wrote anything that meant anything or had an idea worth writing every day and he said no but I was there in case I did so, <laughs> and, and that's kind of the way I was with my uh, writing I just always I always tried to have a writing appointment I'm a, I prefer to co-write uh, that's because of my lack of discipline as a writer. I, I'm much better off if I've got somebody in there with me that is expecting me to show up at 9.30 and yeah. stay as long as we're productive. So It like, seems like in country music, they, they take phrases that people use in normal parlance and, and turn them into a song. My biggest hit uh, by far... Uh, is a song that Alabama recorded called Love in the First Degree. And I guess it kind of fits into the inspiration uh, side of it. W when you're a writer, while you always have your writer ears on, you're listening to people talk and you're thinking, you know, you're looking for ideas. And and uh, I still remember exactly the moment that I had that idea. I was sitting at a corner and it was a hot day and I had the window down on my pickup truck that I was driving. And the guy next to me's radio was blaring, and uh, the newscaster said so and so was found guilty of murder in the first degree. And I don't know why, but just because I had that thought, I was going to write. I was where I was going. I thought murder in the first degree. That's 
that's a strong term, you yeah. know. And by the time I got to the writer's house, uh, why I, I had thought love in the first degree, and I bumped into Jim Shear, one of my good friends, and then we went upstairs and wrote it, wrote it in one day. And, Is that uh, right? Yeah. That well, now your other one, your other song, <laughs> uh, that re must have required inspiration <laughs> or experience, was uh, uh, about the she got the she the got elevator. The <laughs> I got the shaft. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that's my mother's favorite song. Uh, <laughs> this that was a Jerry Reed song, and and people always ask if that was from experience, and and in reality it wasn't. I was still semi happily married at the time I wrote it. Uh, now it did turn into a self fulfilling prophecy <laughs> later in my life. Uh, and uh, ironically, as a part of the divorce settlement, why she got half of the rights to that song, and and uh, so I guess that's justifiable. Yeah. But, and that's that idea actually came from uh, a friend of mine. Just one day said, "Yeah, my first marriage was like a gold mine. Only problem was when we split up. Why well, all I got was the shaft, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I just carried that around for me. And and then one day when I was sitting there, now I said I like to co-write, but I do." When I'm writing something funny, where I can sit there and amuse myself, I can write by myself. So I did write and then, that one by and myself. And then, do you put the music to it? Is that? It, it it depends. I don't necessarily start. I have I have written complete lyrics and then written the music to it. Uh, a lot of the Restless Heart stuff, which is a band that I that I put together and produced and managed. Uh, work the other way around. The band would do the music and they would make a, a cassette of basically just a chord progression with really no melody or anything but it was just the drums and the guitars and the feel and the change of it. And then I would ride around, uh, you know, in the car or the truck with the cassette in there for sometimes weeks at a time waiting for you know something to inspire me and 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 do it so i've done it both ways you ended up having five didn't you Number yes i've ones. had five all together and yeah. then you had a top 20 in the top 10 or 20 well, or something I, like I, that. i've had yeah i've had i've had 20 some odd uh that i wrote that were top 10 or, or yeah. number ones and then as a producer, I've had a lot more than that because I've produced a lot of records too. Well, let's get into that. How did you, how'd you move from writing and into, uh, I mean, you basically were producing acts, right? Right. I, I, producing is kind of a natural evolution for a lot of songwriters because when you are a songwriter, you have to produce your own demos. You have to make some kind of tape that's acceptable to, to play to people. Uh, so that's where I first started producing was in doing my own stuff. And then Restless Heart, uh, after Love in the First Degree, I spent a lot of time trying to have another one of those great big crossover hits. Yeah. I, wrote, I was a huge Eagles fan and I loved what Alabama was doing because it reminded me of the Eagles and I felt like there was a need for that in, in country music. And I wrote a lot of that stuff and, and I couldn't, really get anybody to record it. I, I would pitch it in Nashville and they'd say it was too pop. I'd pitch it in LA and they'd say it was too country and it just didn't work. So I literally built the band, Our uh, Restless Heart, to do a group of songs that some of my friends and I had written. And as a producer, you're, you're kind of, you're the guy that's overseeing everything. You're hiring the musicians. You're you're sitting behind the the board with the engineers, the one that's actually twirling all the buttons and everything. But you're the one that's saying that's right or let's do that again or whatever. And uh, that's something that I, I really really liked in the beginning. I, I grew later in my career to to not like it so much. But, but you the you produce Vince Gill. No, I didn't really produce Vince. I wrote, I wrote When I Call Your Name with Vince, which oh, was yeah. the song that became Maybe. his first number one. And I managed Vince, but I didn't produce him. So who have you managed? Uh, Vince, uh, for a short while. A uh, young man by the name of Keith Urban, yeah. back when uh, Keith, back before he was a star. Before I managed a lot of people Urban. before he was, before they were stars. I managed Restless Heart. That's what I, how I got started right. in management. Uh, and a group called Foster and Lloyd. Uh, and then a lot of, of acts that are Oklahoma and Texas acts over the last few years, I've been involved more with 
what they call the red dirt scene or the mm -hmm. Texas Oklahoma scene here. I manage Roger Crager, who's a big name in that marketplace. Wade Bowen, uh, the kid. But, is, but didn't you have Brooks and Dunn? Well, Brooks and Dunn. Uh, they, I, I think what you're thinking of is I signed them to my record label. Oh, okay. Because you did. You ended up I, I ended talk about up, that. Getting yeah. The, in in, uh, in 1988, I turned 40 years old. And uh, I had taken the job to, to be the head of Arista Records, which is a, a funny story in and of itself. I never intended to run a record label. I never, I never had any intention of it. My imagination wasn't big enough to even think about that. But Clive Davis, who's a legendary music guy, he decided he wanted to open a country label. And, and uh, I took the interview with Clive uh, so that I could meet him because I had read his book and here's the guy that signed Bruce Springsteen, Janis Joplin, Santana. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And I wanted to be able to say I'd met him. So, so I, took the, I took the interview uh, and, uh, you know, we just hit it off. And, and uh, you know, I, I think I was a little bit cavalier because I didn't think I wanted the job. And he played me some acts that I, t I didn't like. And I told him why I didn't think they would work. And uh, I think that's probably in the end, uh, you know, what, what got me the job. The fact that the one thing we agreed on were songs. We were both very, very song driven. Um, and all of a sudden, I was running a record label. Well, Tim, obviously, the music business has changed a lot oh, in the God. years you've been involved in it, going yeah. from those those reel-to-reel -reel tapes yeah. to <laughs> streaming on yeah. Spotify and yeah. Pandora today. How has that affected the music business? Is it harder, better, uh, worse? I mean, well, just, it's it's quite candidly, it's been awful because uh, starting in two thousand. That's where the music industry peaked. It was a 15, the U.S. market was a 15 billion dollar market in 2000. And is that when Apple and iTunes and all well, that? actually, what was the big problem was Napster, where oh, well, yeah, people right. came in and started being able to download without paying all kinds of music, and, and there were other factors involved, but that that was the big factor, and it's literally been downhill almost continuously until a couple of years ago. It, it actually went all the way from 15 billion to a little less than 7 billion a couple of years ago. Now just within the last couple of years because of streaming as you mentioned, things have started to come back a little bit. Uh, they're not anywhere back near like where they were. But well, You so were explaining better. to me that you know in the old days when you bought CDs, you bought the whole album. Now right. you just buy two songs. Right. Well, that's exactly right, and, and you used to, you know, you used to pay sixteen dollars or eighteen dollars sometimes for a CD, and now you can stream something, you know, and the record company gets pennies out of it, you know, and the songwriter gets fractions of fractions of fractions of pennies. But, but it is enough that's going on that it's starting to have. There's a little bit of optimism involved. Now you got into it as a songwriter, correct? But you've you've got accounting expertise. Yes. Has there oh. been a a parallel? Oh, in, it's in been it? tremendously helpful. I, I, you know, I am uh, one of those people that's blessed or cursed with a left brain, right brain conflict, and and uh, a lot of creative people just don't have any business instincts at all. They, they literally, if they love it, they love it, and it never crosses their mind that they have to make a living off of it. That's just what they do. So if you have someone who has the academic training and also has that aptitude for the business side of it and still is creative, that's, that's a rare bird. And all modesty aside, I'm a rare bird. I'm one of those guys that... that gets both sides of it. I can love an idea or love an artist, but I never quit thinking about, is this really somebody that I can, you know, make money off of and, yeah. and make it work? So that's uh, a huge part. I know that there's a, a new music program there at OSU, music business program. I think that's exciting. You know, I, I met with some of the students when I was on campus last time, and uh, that's an interesting deal. It, it is... It is uh, a calling, not a rational but business decision, <laughs> to, to be in the music business. I've, I've done a lot of those, and it's it's just that's just the reality of that situation. 
but the kind of training that they're going to get is going to qualify them for a whole host of other things that maybe are not directly related to music. But as our whole digital media landscape changes and, and as the way that we discover and consume music changes, they're going to have a good background to do that with. Well, well, with that, I want to thank you for doing Inside OSU. It's been fascinating. I, I could talk to you all day. It's, I know you're getting ready to do the executive briefing for the uh, Spear School of Business. I know everybody's going to really enjoy it. Well, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, thanks for joining you're us, You're very Tim. welcome, Burns. Thank you. Well, that's another edition of Inside OSU, this time with Tim Dubois. What a wonderful guest. What a great conversation. Uh, we're looking forward to seeing you next time on Inside OSU. Go Pokes!